Hey everyone, welcome back. I know this video is a little later than usual, but at least I'm still here. Before we get into the stories, I need to mention that every single one of these stories is very messed up. Just about all these stories mention murder, and the final story mentions sexual assault. Please pay attention to the timestamps, as I do label them so you know what you're getting yourself into. And remember everyone, you can send your own story at southerncannibal.com. Now if you're all ready, let's go ahead and get started on these disturbing stories. And remember, to always stay hungry. The story happened a long time ago, but I still remember it as if it happened yesterday. My cousin and I, both of which were 14-year-old females at the time, were having a sleepover one summer night. We spent the night in sort of a summer house, a one-room building which had electricity, a table and chairs, a stove, and two mattresses that we were supposed to sleep on. We didn't sleep, of course, and we spent the night eating instant noodles, trolling people on Omegle, and having fun. We had stayed up until around 4 a.m., I can't remember whose idea it was, but we agreed on going outside into the cornfields. I forgot to mention that this happened in rural Poland, in a place where large empty fields surrounded us on all sides, with only a few houses littered here and there. Due to the cornfields position atop a sort of hill, we thought they'd be a great place to watch the sunrise, and they were. We left the summer house and stepped outside where it was really cold and slightly dark. Although the sun was just about peeking over the short, steep grassy hill a few hundred meters in front of us. The cold breeze compelled us to wear jumpers, although our legs still trembled, as all we were wearing were thin PJs. When we got there, we walked slowly through the massive field, admiring the sunrise and just talking amongst ourselves. I must admit that we were getting quite nosy, since we didn't expect anybody to hear us anyways. I mean, who else could be possibly treading the pass of this cornfield at four in the morning? Suddenly, my cousin stopped mid-sentence and looked into the distance with a horrified expression. This scared me, of course, and I turned quickly to where she was looking. Somewhere in the distance, I spotted a group of about five men wearing dark clothes. From their height and body shape, I assumed all of them to be around 18 to 20 years old. I felt my heart sink once I saw them, since I'd gotten so comfortable in having no one around. The first question that popped into my mind was, what the hell are these guys doing here? However, as soon as that thought appeared in my head, it was answered because that was when I noticed what they were all standing around. It was another guy like them who was kneeling on the ground. My cousin and I just stood in silence, watching the whole scene unfold. Over the occasional chirp of a bird and the constant noises of crickets hidden in the corn, we heard one of the men talking in an aggravated tone. Another responded in a much more quiet way, to which the first man responded still angry. Although it was still very much dark outside, and the sky was only just beginning to turn from pitch black to orange, the faint sunlight allowed us to see how the one man kicked the one kneeling on the ground. As he fell to the ground, another guy kicked him, and soon, all the guys in the circle were now beating this poor dude up. After what felt like hours, but was probably only about five minutes, one man picked up the one that was getting beaten up, and we saw that he was limp and didn't react. He dropped him on the ground and promptly started to scan the fields for witnesses, I assume, and so did the others he was with. We knew what we had just witnessed wasn't meant for us to see. My cousin grabbed my right arm and then ran in the direction from where we came and then said in a panicked voice, I think they saw us. We took the path that would take us to the summer house the quickest, which ended up not even being a path but it was more like a run through the hard stalks that were left after the weed had been harvested. I know I shouldn't have, but I took a glimpse behind me while running. I swear I saw the group slowly heading in our direction with that limb bloody body left in the field. I nearly fell over, running back down the steep hill, but thankfully, 
My cousin caught me. We ran back inside and locked the doors, then promised ourselves we'd never go back into those fields at such an ungodly hour ever again. My cousin's legs got cut up pretty badly when we ran through that weed, since she was wearing shorts unlike me. To this day, you can still see some of the faint scars where the scratches were. They serve as an everlasting reminder of what we witnessed that night, and what we'll probably never find out. I'm going to tell you about how my uncle lost his life. Trigger warning for murder. This all happened during the night of November 3rd, 2013 in Henderson, Nevada. So my uncle and his on again, off again girlfriend went to a bar or party. They were both drinking and later on in the night, they got into an argument. When they were leaving, she decided to take his car keys and leave him there. Him wanting his car keys back, he walked to her apartment to get them from her. Obviously, we only have her side of the story, but she said that she was scared for her life, so she went to a neighbor guy's apartment to get him to go back to her apartment with his gun to wait for him to show up. They said when my uncle showed up, he was trying to kick in the door, but he couldn't. While he was doing that, the guy had yelled that he had a gun and he wasn't afraid to shoot. Side note. My uncle used to be a bounty hunter, and he kicked in doors for a living. If he really wanted to kick the door in, he probably could have. Apparently, my uncle kept trying to kick in the door. After a while, he then opened her window and climbed in. When my uncle did that, the guy told him not to take another step or he would shoot. Well, he stemmed towards them, saying that all he wanted was his keys. When my uncle stepped forward again, the neighbor guy shot him, not once, but 11 times, one of them being in the head. I haven't mentioned this part, but the neighbor guy was an ex-military, so you would think he would know where to shoot to injure and where to shoot to kill. With them saying it was self-defense, and the fact that my uncle was a felon, no one got charged for his murder. In my honest opinion, if she was so scared for her life, why didn't she stay at the neighbor's apartment rather than bringing him back to her apartment and waiting for him? It makes no sense to me. I honestly feel like they planned for this to happen, because a few months later, they announced they were together, and they even took pictures of themselves shooting at targets in the desert. So yeah, that's how my uncle lost his life. This year will be 10 years since it happened. It still kills me inside knowing they're out there living their life like nothing ever happened. If anyone wants to check the validity of this story, I'll have an article linked in the description. This is a massive trigger warning for domestic violence and child abuse and murder. It's really dark. This is not my story, but my aunt's. For privacy, I won't say their real names, but I will attach his name at the end for Southern Cannibal so that it can research the end of the story. Just to let you all know guys, this story is indeed real. They sent me an article, but out of respect for them and their family, I can't include it. Anyways, continuing on with the story. When I was about nine years old, my favorite aunt asked my mom if she could have me and my younger brother and have a sleepover at her apartment because she was having a rough time and she wanted to spend some time with us. My mom agreed and we were so excited. We had a really great day that day. We had gone swimming, then we went to McDonald's afterwards for dinner. I had noticed the whole day she was a little sad, but as a young kid, I couldn't comprehend why. She told me that her boyfriend would no longer be coming around, and I was a little sad, but I didn't care too much. Well, fast forward to nighttime, and we're watching a movie on her pull-out couch bed. It had to have been pretty late at night, because my brother was asleep and I was dozing off when my aunt had gotten up to take a call in the other room. Now, I was a nosy kid, so of course I was eavesdropping and I could hear her saying to someone on the phone, No, you can't come here. Please, I have my niece and nephew. I don't want to speak to you. She ended the call and she came back to lay with me, 
and I could tell she was anxious. Again, as a young kid, I didn't really think anything of it. About 10 minutes later, I was almost asleep when she had turned off the TV and I heard a knock on the door. I still pretended to be asleep when she opened the door and in barged her ex-boyfriend. He pushed his way in the door and in hushed tones, she tried begging him to leave, but he was gritting his teeth, saying that he really needed to speak with her. He then grabbed her by the neck and then pulled her into her bedroom, then slammed the door. I was really scared at this point because he sounded so angry and he was putting hands on her. I tried shaking my brother awake, but I was trying to be quiet not to alert the ex that I was awake in fear that he would put his hands on me as well. That's when I heard my aunt start crying and he just kept yelling at her to be quiet and some other things that I couldn't make out. Since they were still trying to be somewhat quiet, I got up and I went to the door and I just stood there with my heart in my throat, wondering if I should open the door. Maybe if he'd seen how scared I was, he would leave my aunt and us alone, but I couldn't bring myself to do it. I kept hearing banging noises and my aunt whimpering. I bent down to try and sneak a peek underneath the door to see what was going on, and I could see my aunt on the floor crying, and that's when he started kicking her. I started quietly crying and wondering what to do. At the time, it was the early 2000s, so of course I didn't have a cell phone. I know that my aunt had one, but it was nowhere to be found. Again, I tried to shake my little brother awake, and again he wouldn't wake up. I was so scared, and I had no idea what to do as a nine-year-old girl with no phone and in a strange apartment complex not knowing anyone around. As I was thinking of running to the neighbor's apartment and getting up the courage, the ex-boyfriend must have heard me crying because I then heard the bedroom door open. I thought I was going to vomit when I heard that. I then quickly hid under the blanket and I started to pretend to snore like I was fast asleep. He sat on the bed and he started to stroke my hair and talk to me. He was talking so sweetly like he didn't just sit and beat up my aunt in the other room. I just stayed faking asleep because I couldn't bear to look at him. He suddenly gets up off the bed and he runs into the other room again to find my aunt who had found her cell phone and had called 911. I then heard him scream, You fucking bitch! And he then threw her cell phone at the wall and I heard it shatter. I couldn't sit there anymore, so I jumped off the bed and I ran to the front door. I didn't care if I had no idea where I was anymore. I was going to run to the neighbors and ask for help, but right at that same exact moment, her psycho ex came out, and he was dragging my aunt by her hair, and then screamed and yelled at me. Just go the fuck to bed right now! My brother had finally woken up at that point, and was crying, not able to comprehend what was going on. I ran to him and hugged him while shielding his eyes from our aunt as she was now on the floor being pulled by her hair out the door while she screamed. He then dragged her all the way down to the apartment complex's concrete stairs as we just watched helpless and terrified. I have no idea what he was planning on doing with her. Was he taking her to his car or something? I still don't know. But as he got her down to the parking lot, the cop showed up, and it all becomes a blur after that. The next thing I remember is sitting on the pull-out bed again and my aunt hugging me and my brother and talking to the police. I know that he was taken to jail, but I have no idea what happened after all that, as I can't bring myself to bring up that trauma to my aunt to ask her what happened. All I know is that a few years later, that sick son of a bitch was living with another woman and he abused her child, and he just completely lost it one day, and he ended up killing her poor toddler. He's currently still in jail for that offense. It still gives me anxiety thinking about that night. Even though I was a child, I can't help but feel a tiny bit guilty because I didn't do anything to help my aunt. If only I was a little bit more brave, maybe she wouldn't have been hurt so damn badly. I know it's not my fault, but it's just something that I think about from time to time. Luckily, my aunt never had to see him ever again and she went on to find a much-loving, wonderful husband, and they had two great kids. 
As for that garbage human being who beat up my aunt in the presence of two young kids and then ended up murdering a defenseless toddler, I hope you get beat up and fucked every day in prison and that you burn in hell for all of eternity. Thank you all for listening to my story. I know it was a long and heavy one, and thanks to Southern Cannibal for narrating it. Please be careful who you let into your lives, everyone. And if there's even an inkling that they might be a psycho, drop them from your life. I'm a 23-year-old female, and this happened when I was about 13 years old. My mom was a single parent before meeting my stepdad, and we lived in a town in the UK. Before I tell my story, I want to explain a term that I'll use for anyone outside of the UK. The area I'm from refers to that stairwell area right outside your front door, but still within the apartment block as the close. I just want to make that clear in case anyone isn't familiar with that term. We also use the term flats instead of apartments. Anyway, it was summer, so the school holidays had begun for me. I can't remember if it was a weekday or the weekend, but it was about a quarter past nine in the morning and my mom and I had to go to the supermarket. When we got back, it was probably half past 10 or probably closer to 11 a.m. We walked into our block of flats, and when we entered the close area, we saw that someone's front door was wide open, and there was blood all over the ground, leading into the actual house. We both froze, and my mom tried to shield me as she approached the door. Our flat was on the top floor, but our block of flats only had four levels, so it wasn't a high rise. We were very familiar with the man who lived in this flat, and we knew that he had some addiction issues, but he had never caused any trouble, and he was always very quiet and polite whenever we saw him in the street. I hadn't noticed that the man was sitting in his hallway at the front door because all I could focus on was the blood, and like I said, my mom was trying to shield me. She asked the man if he was okay, and he began sobbing. I heard some shuffling, and the man saying, Please help me. My mom placed down the shopping bag she was holding, and got out her phone. She then called for an ambulance, telling them that the man had been stabbed. It was at this point that I could see the man more clearly. He was trying to move out of his hallway, but he was struggling to move. I can't remember exactly where he had been stabbed, but it was around his midriff area, like his stomach or side. He was covered in blood, and the knife was still sticking out of him, and it was a huge kitchen knife. He was holding it, but I couldn't tell if he was trying to hold it in or stop it from moving, or if it was just a pain reflex. He was whimpering, and he had tears all over his face, and he was covered in sweat. I was so shocked from this. I had never seen anything like that before, and I didn't know what to do. The man had said something to my mom about how a man had stabbed him and fled, and that he was really sorry, but he needed help. I can't remember if my mom got off the phone with the 999 operator, or if she stayed on the line until the ambulance and police arrived, but I remember that she told me to stand right at the stairway, and she took some shopping bags up into our flat. I had my phone and we had family literally right across the street, so I was safe to stand there. Now, I know some might judge my mom for taking up the shopping bags, but she told me later that she took them up just to make sure the ambulance people had plenty of space when they arrived to get our neighbor on a stretcher and to do whatever they needed to do. Until you're in a situation like this, it's really hard to know exactly how you would react, and I understood her reasoning. I was still in shock, and I was frozen to the ground. I remember trying not to look at the man because I didn't want him to feel like I was judging him or something. I know it sounds stupid in hindsight, but in my 13-year-old head, I thought that if I stared at him, it would make him feel worse, and I was way too frozen to comfort him. I really regret that now. I stared at the ground, and I couldn't get over the amount of blood. The man was conscious, but he looked exhausted. And when my mom came back down, his head was rolling back and he looked like he was struggling to keep his eyes open. When the ambulance and police finally arrived, 
my mom and I went upstairs to our flat. We looked out the window and we saw them being taken away once they'd done whatever they had to do with the clothes. We later found out that he had apparently been stabbed because he owed money to a drug dealer and he kept putting off paying it. We knew that he had addiction struggles, but we didn't know the details of what substances he was dependent on. I still don't. The drug dealer showed up at his house and was demanding the money, which the man didn't have. The drug dealer was really sick of the man not paying him, and they got into an argument. The dealer then stabbed him and then fled the scene. I assumed that he brought his own knife with the intent to harm the man because we found the man slumped right at his front door, with the door lying wide open. There was blood in the clothes and in his hallway. So the man must have been standing just outside his door and maybe dragged himself into the hallway to lean against the wall, hoping someone would enter the clothes or exit their flat and come across to help him. It also scares me to think that if we arrived home later, we might have stumbled across a dead body. I don't know how long he was bleeding out for, and he'd already lost a lot of blood already. It was really lucky that we got to him when we did, and that we didn't encounter the drug dealer. The man fortunately survived, but I think that he avoided us afterwards. We knew that he survived because my town was full of tons of gossip, and people found out he was doing alright in the hospital. We would see his living room curtains open or closed at various times if we were outside, so we knew that he must have gotten home at some point afterwards. However, we didn't see him outside his house again. I wondered if he was too weak to go out, or perhaps he was afraid or just felt ashamed about what happened. He ended up moving away, and someone else eventually moved into his flat. I don't know what happened to him, but I really hope he got the help and support that he needed to get sober. And I hope the man who stabbed him was caught and put in jail. But I'll never know for sure. We eventually moved away from that area a few years later, and it's been so long that there's no way I could ever know where life took our neighbor after this incident. I just hope the man responsible rots in prison for the rest of his life for attempting murder on someone, as well as profiting off someone's addiction. I have not told this story in a long time, and I hadn't even thought about it until I heard something similar happening to my friend's daughter. It really broke my heart to hear about it, and it made me think about what happened to me. My name is Anne, and in 1994, I was 16 and I worked at a 24-hour jack-in-the-box in northern Colorado. It was summertime and so I was working the overnight shift so I could earn some money to buy myself a car. I lived in a college town, and things get pretty busy after the bars start to close and people want those tacos. No clue why, they're gross. But anyway, I really liked the job, and I worked with another guy who was just as chill as could be. Nick was in his 60s, and he was like a grandfather type. If not for him... I don't know what would have happened to me. The story may have had a very different ending. So for a month, it was always just Nick and I on the 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. shift. That was until my new boss, Chris, had started. He came from another store and was the franchise's owner's son and was going to be the new shift manager for my location. Chris wanted to work the night shift a few times with us just to make sure we did things right. Those shifts were great. He was very cute, outgoing, and much older than me. He was 25 or 26, I believe. I'll admit, I had a bit of a crush on him. I didn't try to flirt or lead him on in any way, but I didn't mind the way he looked at me either. He knew I was 16, but he would still compliment me on the way I styled my hair or how nice my figure was. It made me blush, and I liked the attention. Most girls would, I think, but I didn't realize where this would lead. I think today most would see it for what it was. He was grooming me, but back then you didn't really hear about things like that. After about a week, Chris had decided that he needed to work the night shift with me, and he put Nick on the morning shift. He told Nick and I that he thought I needed more training, and that he wanted to be the one who did it. I didn't mind. Like I said... 
I had a crush on Chris. I was really looking forward to spending more time with him. It made the overnight shifts go by really fast. He would goof around blasting that 90s alternative rock and talk about random things. Sometimes he would ask me about my relationships. If I was seeing someone, if I'd ever dated someone older, you know, things like that. I was a very open person, and I told him things that I know now I never should have. I shared way too much personal information. Come payday, and it was my normal routine. I was to wait to pick up my check in the morning after my shift from the day manager. But on that day, she wasn't coming in. So Chris was sticking around to hand out checks to the morning people as they came in. I was done with my shift, and I wanted to get my check. So I went upstairs to the office. Chris was waiting there for me and he told me to come in and lock the door. I kind of laughed at this, and I asked why he needed me to lock the door. Well, he said he had something private to talk to me about. The look on his face and tone of his voice made it sound like I was in trouble or something. I got a bit worried, thinking I was getting fired for something. He told me that if I wanted to get my check, I would have to do him a favor. I asked what he was getting at, and he said that I needed to come around the desk and get on my knees. I was in shock. I replied back with, You're joking, right? He didn't smile. He said that if I wanted to get my check, I had to suck him off, and that he knew that I wanted him, that he knew I wouldn't say no. At this point, Chris has his pants unbuttoned, and his dick was peeking out. He added that if I didn't do it, I would be fired. His dad was the owner, so who would he believe? Him or me? I honestly didn't really know what to do. I needed this job, and I hadn't been in a situation like this before. I mean, I did think he was cute and I did like him, but I knew him being so much older made it wrong. Hell, being my boss made it wrong. But once again, I wasn't sure what to do. He saw the panic in my face then softened his voice, saying it really was okay. If I didn't want to do it, I didn't have to. That he was sorry for making a threat. That if instead, and if I wanted to, he would take me out to dinner and a movie. He said not to tell anyone, and that he was really sorry. He just really liked me, and he thought we could date. I told him that I wasn't sure if I could date him, but that we could try being friends. I don't know why I said that, why I didn't just quit right there, but I was very overwhelmed and confused about my feelings, about his threats, and just everything. He handed me my check, and he asked if he could drive me home. I said that I needed some time to think about things, and that I had my bike, and that I could get myself home. He said he would see me tonight for work, and once again that he was really sorry for upsetting me. I said thank you, and then I left. The bike ride home gave me some time to think about what happened, and I just kept questioning myself. Did I lead him on? Was I being flirty and didn't know it? Did I want him? I somehow convinced myself that it was my fault that I had given him the wrong idea. I made it home and went to bed, but I didn't sleep well though. That evening I showed up to work, and Chris wasn't there yet. Nick was though. I was happy to see him, and I gave him a great big hug. He said that Chris had called him in for that shift. I was honestly very relieved by this. I wasn't really ready to face Chris yet. I decided to tell Nick what happened, and that I didn't want to work with Chris anymore at all, and I wanted to see if I can switch to day shifts or just quit altogether. Nick then said that it wasn't my fault, and to stay away from Chris altogether that I need to tell someone at HR about this and that he'll back me up. I was so glad to hear that someone believed me and that I had options. The night went on smoothly and when Nick had finished up his duties, it was a little before the shift had ended and he said he had to leave a bit early. I told him no problem and that I could finish up the shift solo and I knew that the day crew would be in shortly. It was a Saturday and mornings were slow and managers didn't show up normally. Nick said goodbye, and then left. I had just finished the cash drop, 
and I was waiting the last 20 minutes or so until day shift showed up so that I could help the random customer that may come in, which much to my surprise, Chris shows up. He came inside and went right into the office. He didn't say anything to me. I didn't want to talk to him anyway. I was still really processing what had happened the day before. So the morning person shows up and I get ready to leave. When Chris opens the office door and he asked me to come in, I obliged and I went in. I wanted to tell him off and tell him that I didn't like what he had done. He said again that he was sorry about what happened. I said we could just move past it. It was over. Whatever it was, he thought it had been. But then he walked behind me and he locked the door. That made me nervous. I knew that no manager would be in today and no one else saw him come in and go to the office. He also can watch the cameras. So here I am alone with a guy who's really started to make me feel so uncomfortable. My brain finally clicks that I'm in danger. Chris approaches me and then hugs me from behind. I can now feel that he has a hard on. I wasn't enjoying this and I said as much. I said I really needed to get home and that I do not like this. He holds me tighter and I start trying to wiggle out of his grasp. He tells me that I've been nothing but a big dick tease and that I want what is coming. I said that I didn't and I don't like this and that he needs to let me go. I told him I would scream but he told me that no one would believe me. That he'll say that I stole money and I'll be fired. He then pushes me down onto the floor and starts kissing my neck. I just froze. It was like my whole body just stopped responding. I was there, but I wasn't. He had almost gotten my pants off when I then heard knocking on the office door. It was Nick, and he then said, Hey Chris, I saw your car outside, and I see Ann's bike as well. Is everything okay? Chris told me to be quiet. He said to Nick that we were just talking about schedules and that we would be out soon. Nick then said, Well, I think it's been long enough. Maybe you should come out now. This really spooked Chris, and he let me up. He told me to not say a word and just leave. I went to the door and opened it up. Nick was there, and he asked if I'm alright. I told him I am now and that I need to go. He said to go wait in his car. It's unlocked, and he'll be out shortly. I go to his car and and as soon as I sit down, I just start crying and shaking, and I get really mad. I'm so mad at myself for letting this happen. Mad at Chris for being a creep and thinking how stupid I was. Nick comes out a few minutes later, and he told me that he told Chris that if he ever put another hand on me again, that he would lose it. I asked Nick why he came back, and he told me that he had forgotten his jacket and had had his wallet inside. That he noticed my bike was still here, and that Chris's car was here as well. He said that he just had a feeling that something was wrong after what I had told him about the day before. Nick then says to grab my bike and put it in the back of a station wagon that'll drive me home. He tells me that it's my choice, but that I really should tell the cops and call HR. I tell him that I'm scared and I'm not really sure if that's what I want. He told me that I did nothing wrong and that Chris is a creep and that he most likely has done this before. I agree, and I said I would make a report, and I then asked him to take me to the police station. To wrap things up, Chris got fired, and a couple of other girls came forward from another store, saying that he tried to do the exact same thing to them. He only got a slap on the wrist, though. No jail, and he had to do some community service, since he never did actually rape anyone. So yeah... I really hope I never meet Chris ever again, and I hope he never hurt anyone else. Hey everyone, I hope you all enjoyed these stories. If you ever want to submit your own, you can do so at southerncannibal.com. Have a good night everyone, and remember, to always, stay